All right, we're on John chapter 18. And um, John chapter 18, so this means just three more chapters after this one, and we'll have the entire Gospel of John in. So hopefully you guys are kind of uh, following along um, with uh, ever since John 13, we've kind of entered into this uh, final stage where Jesus calls his last hour, his hour has come. And uh, that's been going on all the way through now, John 18. And last week we did this amazing prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17, uh, praying for himself, praying for his apostles and praying for uh, we, the future believer. So now uh, comes the consummation of his coming which is his uh, suffering. So um, let's open in a word of prayer and we'll get right into John chapter 18. Our Father, it's in Jesus' name we come to you, Lord. And we come to you, Lord, as um, some of us are tattered and torn, some of us are weary. Lord, some of us are uh, have our strength renewed. Lord, we're all in different places, but we're all here for you. So we pray that you would be with us in this study. Lord, you administer to our hearts and souls and our minds. And Lord, that uh, we would have the full effect of the Spirit's work on us happen through the study of your word tonight. Thank you for my friends that are out there that tune in, uh, Lord, because they love your word. And we pray that that love would even increase tonight in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Into the study we go. Here we go. John chapter 18. Immediately following the high priestly prayer of Christ, John 18 begins with, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he, he and his disciples entered. Now that's all you're going to get from the garden of Gethsemane scene from the apostle John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke give you the details of what, of his agony in the garden. John is less interested in Jesus's agony in the garden as he is in this betrayal that took place. Now, because he's betrayed and because he's about to be arrested, I do want to remind you that none of this is outside of Jesus's will and sovereignty. Uh, in John chapter 10, I just want to remind you, and this is the context for your understanding John 18. In John 10, Jesus said, therefore my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down and, to and I have the power to take it again. So all the power for Jesus being arrested, crucified, and eventually raised is his. So this is um, his voluntary uh, arrest and so forth is what I want you to keep in mind. So. So there's no mention of Gethsemane in verse one, but in verse two, it says, and Judas who betrayed him also knew the place for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Jesus sends Judas off in John chapter 13 to betray him. He dismisses him from the last supper to betray him and then intentionally goes to the very spot that Jesus knows, Judas knows he'll be at. This is not what we do when we're betrayed, right? We don't go to the place where we know that they're gonna come looking for us. But Jesus does, it's part of his voluntary uh, surrender to his Father's will here. Verse three, then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, whom are you seeking? Now, a Roman detachment, this says there was a Roman detachment. A detachment was typically 1,000 soldiers. But very often when we read about Roman detachments, there's six or 700 of them in that detachment. So even if there's only six or 700 of them in that detachment, and it says that there was also officers from the chief priests and Pharisees. So these would be the Jewish guards of the Pharisees and so forth. So there's gotta be anywhere between 700 and 1,000 people that show up to arrest one. That's not fair. <laughs> They'll need more people. 
he's mightier than the six, 700 or the thousand or, or whatever. And I find that absolutely remarkable. Now, uh, this says Jesus knowing all things that will come upon him, and you know all the negative things are about to come, come upon him, it says he went forward. Knowing all the things that are to come upon to him, he went forward. Knowing the suffering, knowing the agony, knowing the betrayals, knowing all these things that are gonna happen to him, he still goes forward. This is dedication to the will of God. This is true dedication to doing the Father's will. Think of the things that are our obstacles to doing the Father's will. Even if it's just not sinning, not committing a sin that we're about to commit. We know it's not the Father's will we commit that sin, but are we this strong? Are we this committed to doing the will of God that we can walk away from sin or walk towards chastisement or something like that that we know we'll get at work if we mention Christ or whatnot? So I just want you to see the determination of your Lord to save you here. And then Jesus asks this question in the end of verse four, whom are you seeking? And we need to ask ourselves that same question. Many people in our country especially seek after not a biblical version of Jesus, the biblical version of Jesus that says, take up your cross daily and follow me. But rather they seek out a Jesus that it seems to just be here for your prosperity or your wealth or your health or things like that. That is not a biblical version of Jesus, yet some of the biggest churches in the world are those prosperity churches. So the question becomes, whom do you seek? Now, anybody would like to seek out the health, wealth, and prosperity people. But in this fallen world that chose to be separate from God, when God reaches down a hand to save us, we should not be saying, I want wealth and I want comfort and I want these things. We have to understand what Job understood. Shall we not take both only, shall we not take only good from the Lord? Shall we not also take uh, evil from the Lord? As long as it's from the Lord, as David learned when he had to take the plague on after counting his army, that he wants to be in the hands of the Lord. With, with bad that comes and with good that comes. We can't only accept the good. We must also accept negativity that comes our way. So whom are you seeking when you seek out Jesus? I would say make sure your definition of Jesus fits precisely with scripture. Verse five, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am, and I hope your Bible has the word he there in italics because it's not in the original. Jesus just said, I am. Now you're probably sensing the significance of that. That's the Greek phrase, ego, a me. And both ego means I am and a me means I am. So this is why we say, this is like Jesus saying, I am whom I am. I am who I am. And that's what the, that's where we get the name Yahweh from. That, that's the ego, a me comes from Yahweh in Hebrew. And that's the name that God gave to Moses at the burning bush. And so with all these I am statements that Jesus gave, especially in John's gospel points them out. I am the door, I'm the good shepherd, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, I'm the resurrection and the life. Um, all these I am statements, these are the powerful ego amis of Jesus. And watch the power of this ego ami, because he says to them, I am. And Judas who betrayed him also stood with them. Now, when he said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. They drew back and fell to the ground. And here's what I wrote in my Bible that I like about that. Paul said in Philippians 2, quoting the Old Testament, that every knee will bow to Jesus. And here I see these people that have come to arrest them. When they fall down, I see this bowing of the knee to him. They're on the ground as Jesus stands above them. And that's exactly where they belong, quite frankly. It's where we all belong. And so, uh, but what I, want, what I want to point out to you guys is this. These are war-torn, battle-tested soldiers that did something, fell down, that all their training was designed to prevent them doing. These are trained warriors. They're not to be falling down. This is what happens to us, though. 
We lose our balance when we don't rightly receive the revelation of Jesus Christ. We lose our balance. And I don't mean we lose our physical balance. I mean we lose our moral compass. We lose who we are. We lose our balance. We see wrong as right. We see evil as good. We see pornography as morally neutral. And we see abortion as a free will choice rather than murder. This is how we get tangled up in relativism. We lose our balance morally when we don't receive the proper revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only absolute standard of morality we could ever look to. What could possibly, other than him, be a, an absolute standard of morality? It certainly can't be a human being. It's got to be something above and beyond humanity that, that's the absolute standard for morality. Otherwise, it's all relative, and that becomes a disaster. And I believe I'm going to bring that up a little bit later, so I'll move on. Verse 7, then he asked them again, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. So that's twice that that happened. And Jesus answered, I've told you that I am. That I am. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. So this is a second chance offered to the fallen guards. He first says, whom are you seeking? They say, Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I am. Now there's an opportunity for them to go, hey, wait a minute. I've heard about the leper that was healed or the blind man that sees. I've heard about the wonderful things that you've been doing. Um, but they don't. Uh, there's no change of heart in any of them. And then um, this says it's to fulfill scripture that Jesus won't lose a single one because he asked for the freedom of his apostles. He says, since I'm telling you I'm he, you have no use for these, these other apostles, let them go. And that's part of the fulfillment that he predicted of himself that he wouldn't lose a single one except for the son of perdition, uh, which of course is Judas Iscariot. Verse 10, then Simon Peter, having a sword, it's probably more likely a dagger, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Now, Luke tells us in his gospel um, about this event, and so does Matthew and Mark, but John actually tells us that it's Malchus and, um, and that Peter did, I'm sorry, Luke tells us that it's Ma Malchus and John tells us that it was Peter that did it to him. The other ones are more vague about what happened there, although they mention the event. But the details come in Luke's gospel, which says the servant's name was Mel, uh, that Peter's the one who did it, and, um, and that the, and John tells us the servant's name is Malchus. Now, can you imagine, I would love to hear a story about Malchus, because Jesus heals him. Jesus will reattach the ear that's probably where the inspiration for Mr. Potato Head came in. But Jesus heals the ear. And can you imagine every single time Malchus hears about Jesus of Nazareth, that he would just touch his ear a little bit and say, I, I believe that story. I believe that story. He's got proof right on the side of his head of the power of Jesus Christ. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which the Father has given me. Now, Jesus is saying, I have to drink this cup that the Father has given me. And what is the cup that he's drinking? Well, it's actually what he allows to happen to himself rather than what he does. From this point forward, we see what we call the passive obedience of Christ. What we saw from his birth up until this point is called the active obedience of Christ. He actively obeys all the law. He actively obeys his father's will to a T. And that gives him his righteousness. If anybody was ever saved by works righteousness, the only person that could say that is Jesus Christ. He fulfilled all the law to the very letter of the law and the spirit of the law. He lived perfectly sinless. And he will say a couple times in this chapter, referring to what sin are you charging me with? There's no sin here that you could possibly hold against me. And nobody can point out a sin to him. 
So I just want you to be able to differentiate between the active obedience of Christ and the passive. The active obedience of Christ is him actually fulfilling the law, obeying his father in every detail. The passive obedience of Christ is him submitting himself to this arrest, to the illegal trial he's about to go under, to the beatings, to the crucifixion. That's all his passive obedience. Now, how can we relate to those? Well, we have, in a sense, active sins and passive sins, but they're not called active and passive sins. They're called sins of commission and sins of omission. Sins of commission are sins that we actively do. We commit these sins. Sins of omission, though, are those that fall into the category of if you know the good that you ought to do and you don't do it, you've sinned. Uh, that's why we've, we've had people say things like, the only thing evil needs in this world to survive is for good people to do nothing. Those are sins of omission. When you see a need, you should meet it. When you have an opportunity to bless, you should do it. Um, your lack of activity could indeed be charged as sin to you, sins of omission. So just like we see Christ's righteousness in these active and passive ways, our sin happens that way also, actively commit, committing it and passively omitting the good that we ought to be doing. Now, we see Jesus' passive obedience in the marvelous words of Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 5, which is quoting the book of Exodus. But listen, this is one of my favorite prophecies about Jesus. It says, therefore, when he came into the world, he said, this is Jesus in the Old Testament speaking to his father. This is you eavesdropping on a conversation before Christ ever became a man between Jesus and his father. And he says this to his father, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. So what is that conversation saying? Jesus is saying to his father, you're taking no pleasure in the sacrificial system. We've heard God complain to some of the Old Testament prophets that um, they offer up faulty animals, animals that have spots and blemishes or blindness or disease. And he says, you wouldn't even give these animals to your governors. If your governor came for dinner, you would do better for them than you do for me, the Lord your God. So people were making a mockery of the sacrificial system. And this is a picture of Jesus looking at his father and saying, I know you don't desire these sacrifices, but rather a body that you prepare for me. He's saying, I know you want to prepare a body for me to go and lay, down, lay it down as a sacrifice for you. And then it continues by saying that Jesus says, behold, I have come in the volume of the book that's written of me. In other words, it's prophesied to do your will, O God. I will be that sacrifice for you. This is the passive obedience of Christ in a most wonderful and marvelous and loving sacrificial way you could ever imagine, okay? It's a beautiful picture. All right, verse uh, 12. It says, then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was, a, it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Now, so they first bring him to Annas, and it says they bring him to Annas, and he's the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who is the high priest at the time. So the question naturally gets asked, why didn't they go straight to Caiaphas if Caiaphas is the high priest? Well, it's the Romans who appointed Caiaphas as the high priest to serve in kind of keeping the Jews under control so that the Romans didn't have to deal with uprisings. But the Jews didn't really recognize Caiaphas as the high priest because it's their law that says, once you're a high priest, you're a high priest till death. And Annas was the high priest and he's still alive. So the Jews recognized Annas still as the high priest at that time, 
where the Romans were recognizing Caiaphas as the high priest. So as the Jews are bringing Jesus to be judged, they naturally bring him to Annas, the one that they recognize, even though the Romans have appointed Caiaphas as the high priest, okay? So uh, that's what, why we have these two different guys involved here. Now it says it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. So when they're trying to figure out a few chapters ago, what are we gonna do with Jesus and all of these people that are following him now? And they said, if we let him continue, everybody will end up following him. Wouldn't that be awful? And it was Caiaphas that stood up and said, don't you realize that it's expedient that one man should die for the nation rather than the whole nation perish? And the Bible literally says after that, Caiaphas didn't know as the high priest that year, he was actually prophesying the truth there. It is expedient that one man die rather than the whole nation perish. If Jesus doesn't die on this cross, then that whole nation and our nation and all nations will indeed perish. So Jesus becomes the one that can die for the many. All right, uh, verse 15. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. We know this to be John. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. So it says John has some familiarity with the high priest. And what we see from some extra biblical sources is that John seemed to have some relationship with the Sanhedrin. That's the group that made up the Pharisees and the scribes and all of them together were the Sanhedrin. And John seemed to have some relationship to that. So with those connections, as Jesus is led into the praetorium, John's able to, to, to go in with them, where of course he wouldn't be allowed if he didn't have a connection. 16, but Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. So he's able to say, thanks for letting me in. Can you let my, my buddy Peter come in as well? Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, you're not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers who made the fire of coal stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Now, you ever just want to be somewhere that maybe you shouldn't be, and you pull a string or two to get in there? Well, that's kind of what Peter just did. But you have to be careful what you wish for. You have to be careful what you pray for. Because Peter gets what he wants, he gets in the door, and what immediately happens to him? He gets identified as somebody who belongs to Jesus, and he denies it. He denies that it's true. He would have been better off if he just stayed outside. Now, verse 19. The high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. So you have the high priest that's asking about his doctrine and his, his disciples. And that's what a high priest would ask. Uh, somebody in religion is gonna ask somebody that's being accused of something, what's your doctrine? You know, let, let's see where your, your errors are and so forth. And I want you to compare that to Pilate's questioning. Because Pilate's gonna ask political questions where the high priest is asking theological questions to him. Now Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. So first of all, Jesus is trying to redirect this trial, this questioning into its proper protocol. They're not supposed to be questioning Jesus. They're supposed to be questioning witnesses. So Jesus is redirecting them towards witnesses. He's saying, you wanna know what my doctrine is? He says, I taught openly all the time. Nothing that I have to say was ever said privately. Everything I want you to know about doctrine, everything was a public sermon in your temples, in your synagogues. You can ask tons of people the things that I've said. And I think that's a wonderful thing to be able to say. Um, I ask myself, am I living the kind of life where I can say, you want to know about me? Ask all my friends. 
Ask the people who know me. I want to be somebody that has nothing to hide, that there's nobody that's keeping secrets for me. I want to be pure. Why? Um, look at Psalm 24 with me real quick. This Psalm, the first time I read it, from the first time I read it, hit me deep in the heart. Psalm 24, starting in verse three says, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? Now that's gotta make you say, whoever it is, I wanna be a part of that. He, the answer is he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. So who are the, who are the part of the generations that seek after the Lord, who seek the face of the Lord, uh, that receive blessings from the Lord and receive the righteousness from God that leads to salvation? Who are those folks? It says it's those who have clean hands. That means your activity is above reproach. Nobody can look at your activity. If you have clean hands, hands have to do with what you're doing. Um, so the work of your hands, the, the output of your work is upright, filled with integrity and dignity. And it says, and they have a pure heart. That means your motives are right. And when, when, I, when I want you to check your motives, I often say this. I'll say, why do you want to go to heaven? And if your answers have to do with gold streets or treasures or mansions, then I think your heart's not pure. That's what's in it for me type of attitude of going to heaven. I think you need to put your focus in on, I want to meet my Savior. I want to see Jesus. I want to be where he is. He died for you because he said, so that where I am, you may also be. He's doing it for your company, for your presence, not for you, what you can do for him, which what could that possibly be? But it's out of love, love of company, love of who you are and, and his joy in being with you. And that really should be our primary reason for wanting to go to heaven is simply the joy of being with Jesus. If there happens to be other stuff with it, then may, if it pleases him to give it to us, then wonderful. But clean hands, what are you doing? And a pure heart, why are you doing it? That's who may ascend the hill of the Lord. That's the pure heart uh, that we're shooting for. So Jesus is able to say, what you're asking me about, I've done openly, publicly, and you can ask anybody about it. That should be the Christian's life. You can ask anybody about me. You can ask about my private time. You can ask about my public time. This is what we ought to be able to say. Whatever it is that we would keep hidden and in the dark, speaking of judgment day, Jesus said it's all gonna be proclaimed from the rooftop. So you might as well confess it now and not surprise everybody later. And clean yourself and purify yourself. The people of God have to be clean and pure. Can you imagine how attractive to the world we will be and how distinct from the world we will be? I think evangelism through lifestyle can only happen to those who have clean hands and a pure heart. All right. Verse. Oh, I also want to talk about this, about Jesus saying uh, that I've done this openly all the time. Uh, so you can ask anybody about my testimony type of thing. Well, in Acts 26, Paul's able to say virtually the same thing about Christianity. When he's on trial before the governor in Acts 26, Paul's able to say this. Paul's able to say, when he's accused of being kind of insane for the, for the amazing things he's talking about, Paul said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. For the king, before whom I also speak freely, knows these things. He's just been talking about the miracles of Christ and resurrection from the dead. He says, you know these things, for I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention, since this thing was not done in a corner. 
He says, all the things that we're talking about weren't done in some corner that only Peter, John, and James saw. Jesus' life was on public display in major cities all the time. The miracles were done publicly. He never brought a leper into a private room and healed him. He always did it in front of everybody. Same with the blind and the lame. And even the dead, like Lazarus and Tabitha, the little girl. Public displays all the time. Another place you can look, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Second Corinthians 2, um, verse 12. Paul says there, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit. Wait a second, that's not 12. Second Corinthians 2, 12. Oh, man, I think I wrote something wrong, down wrong. All right, let's go to 1 Corinthians then. Chapter... Maybe that's chapter two, give me one sec. First Corinthians 15, two, Paul says this. Verse three says, for I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, then by the 12. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. So he said he, he appeared to over 500 people at once. Many of them are still alive today. That's his way of saying you can go and ask him yourself. So in other words, not only is Jesus saying, my life's been on public display, you can ask anybody about it, but Christianity, Paul can say to Governor Festus, these things weren't done in a corner. And then Paul can say to the Corinthian church that the resurrected Christ appeared to over 500 people at one time. Many of them are still alive today. Go and ask them yourself. In other words, the credibility is there the way you would want it to be there. Um, these people could never get away with saying to, to governors, these things weren't done in a corner. Um, you know about these things yourselves. And the other one that I couldn't find, I must have wrote down the wrong address. When Paul talks about the miracles of Jesus, he says, as you yourselves know. Can you imagine saying to a crowd, he did miracles as you yourselves know, and then they would come back with, we never saw anything. What are you talking about? Obviously, they knew of the miracles of Christ. So Christianity is a very public thing. That's why I love that the Bible is written by many authors, not one. And many witnesses to it, not just one, that makes it certainly true beyond a reasonable doubt. I don't think there's any question about that. All right, verse 22. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand saying, do you answer the high priest like that? Imagine being that guy realizing on Judgment Day that you slapped the Son of God in the face. Not a fun thing. Or you're the Roman guard that spit on him. Just can't believe how they must have felt when they, when they realized what they had done. Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? Okay, here's what Jesus starts to do with this trial. He's the one on trial, but as the judge of all the earth, he starts putting them on trial. He starts here with the, with the guy that slaps him. He says, listen, if I've spoken evil, bear witness of it. But if I've spoken well, then why did you strike me? He's charging him with the wrongdoing. As you'll see, he'll charge Pilate later. He puts them on trial. This is not just the trial of Jesus Christ, which was a false and illegal trial. The true trial is happening to those that are questioning Jesus here. And I think you'll see that as we go. Uh, verse 24, then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter, Peter stood and warmed himself. Therefore they said to him, you're not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him who, whose ear Peter cut off said, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied it again. 
and immediately a rooster crowed. Now, here Peter is asked up to a third time if he knows Jesus, and all three times he says no. And this rooster crows, which was the undeniable moment for Peter, that Jesus was indeed who he said he was. Think about that. He was told earlier that night when Peter swore that even if he had to die with Jesus, he would. And if all the other disciples ran from him, he would stay by his side. And Jesus said, really, Peter, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. So when Peter hears this rooster, it's the undeniable stamp of reality on his soul that he just denied the God of heaven. He just denied the Son of God. Jesus is indeed who he said he was, and the sound of the rooster is absolute proof of that. So that would be a shrill in his spine, a shriek down his spinal cord, the sound of the rooster. It would have been awful for him to hear this. Yet Jesus will still give him an opportunity to repent, which we'll see in our last Monday night together when we do John 21. But what I want you to know is that's an opportunity that God does not owe us. Because you see the Roman guards, Pilate himself, all them, uh, if you go back to the Old Testament, Pharaoh, all of them, they didn't get these second chances. So as I talk about seeking the biblical Jesus, the Jesus that loves us so much that he dies on a cross for us, that's a biblical Jesus. The Jesus that says you're going to have to pick up your cross every day and follow me, that biblical Jesus. The biblical Jesus that says, if you, if you, by comparison to your love for me, if you don't hate your family, then you're not worthy of me. And of course, by hate, they don't have a word for like less or anything like that. So it's always the word hate. So he's simply saying by comparison, uh, your love for me should shine more than, than that of others. This biblical Jesus can offer second chances like he will to Peter. But as Paul will say in Romans, that doesn't give you a license to sin because God does not owe you any chances. Our chance was through our father, Adam, and we failed. Anything that looks like an opportunity to be saved is strictly grace. This to, if you apply even an ounce of God owes us a chance, then you are no longer permitted to call it grace. Now you're, you're, you're pointing to your own worth, and that means if you have worth towards salvation, then God does owe you, and he would be wrong not to give you what he owes you because you're worth all of that. There's something about you worth dying for. So Paul will say in Romans 5 that some people might die for a good man, hardly anybody will die for a righteous man, but we see the love of God in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The sinners being those who deserve the wages of our sin, which is death what we deserve, it's what we've earned. And you need to grasp that for the simple fact of the glory that's due Jesus for the crucifixion, for the cross, I think is only seen in its full beauty when we realize two things. We didn't earn it or deserve it in any shape, manner, or form, and he didn't have to do it. He doesn't owe us that. If you think that we deserve it or you think that he owes us that, then it's not beautiful anymore. It's simply him doing what anybody would do in that, anybody that pays their debts would do for somebody. This is, this is you taking the place in the electric chair of the person that murdered your family. This is that type of sacrifice, that type of glory. And it's, it, it needs to, to take our breath away a little bit more of what was done on our behalf. Hebrews 6 puts it this way, starting in verse 4. This is the impossibility of our worthiness. It says, For it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. They've tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. If they fall away, to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. 
What does he mean by that? Well, he draws an analogy for us in verse seven. For the earth which drinks in the rain and that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessings from God, but if it bears thorns and briars, it's to be rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. So he says, just like the rain falls and the same rain will produce sometimes useful crops, but that same rain also produces thorns and briars. The useful crops go to feed the people. It's useful. The thorns and briars are pulled away from it and put into the fire to be burned because they're useless. So in other words, it's really a picture of, it is our fruit that we're known by. Are we producing useful fruit for the world, for the kingdom of God, or is it useless fruit? Is it no good to anybody? It was only there to serve ourselves. But this impossibility of being renewed to repentance is the actual dynamic of our sin. Yet we see Peter's gonna get a second chance after saying, I don't know him, I don't know him, I don't know him, yet he's gonna be brought back into the fold. But we don't see that with everybody. So the question is, is God unrighteous because he doesn't do it for everybody, or is he righteous because he did it to anybody? And the biblical answer is, if he did it for one, he did it out of his goodness and kindness because he owed it to none. So it's kind of like if you go into a restaurant or here, here's what some people like to do. They go through a drive through and they'll say, hey, I pay for the car behind me just to give somebody a, a good surprise, even though, and it's kind of cool doing that because you can't get a thank you or anything. You just have to do it out of the goodness of your heart. But if, if, uh, if the drive through teller said, I can't believe you didn't do it for everybody. That would be a weird reaction, wouldn't it? The right reaction is, wow, that's really nice you did it for somebody. But it'd be totally wrong to say you're evil because you didn't do it for everybody. That's salvation. If he does it for one, it's such a nice and a good thing. And to demand that he now does it for everybody just doesn't get it. You just, we just don't understand that um, he doesn't owe us a thing. God is not in debt to us. Uh, Jesus tells parables about this in Matthew's gospel, that we owe him 10,000 talents of debt that he's willing to tear up and totally forgive. But he expects when you understand how much forgiveness you're getting, that'll naturally turn you into a great forgiver of others. It's a natural thing, not a supernatural thing. The natural thing is you forgive others their sins against you with the understanding that you've been overwhelmed by forgiveness yourself. So it naturally makes you equipped to forgive others. All right, back to John's gospel. I believe I'm on verse 28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium and it was early morning, but they themselves did not go into the Praetorium lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? Now, amazing hypocrisy is being seen here. Why? The Jews will not go into the Praetorium because it's a Gentile palace. And this is Passover week. Each night of Passover week, there's a Passover feast. But to be allowed to take part in that Passover feast, you have to be undefiled. You have to remain clean. So they won't go into the praetorium where their Lord is being crucified. So the Jewish leadership will not go into there. And the one that they've been teaching about in synagogues every Saturday is now receiving his trial for crucifixion. And they won't go in because they don't want to become unclean when Jesus is paying the price for all the uncleanness. This makes them tremendous hypocrites. If you go to Matthew 23, Jesus called them out on this earlier and now they're living it by saying we're bringing him to trial for you but we got to wait outside because we want to eat a good meal tonight if we go in we're unclean i just want you to see the irony of it i don't know if i'm doing a good job explaining it the irony is that they are trying to stay right with god as they're trying to execute god that's the irony it's massive hypocrisy Matthew 23, 15, Jesus, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Remember, the scribes and Pharisees 
were held in the highest honor amongst the Jewish people. They believed them to be the most real deal with God. For you travel land and sea to win pro one proselyte, and when he's one, you make him twice as much of a son of hell as yourself. Woe to you blind guides who say, whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he's a obliged to perform it. See, what are they marveling over? The outward appearance of the gold rather the, than the holy meaning of the temple. It's all the outward appearances, what they're all about. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gold of the, or the temple that sanctifies the gold? Of course, it's the temple. And whoever swears by the altar, it's nothing, but whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he's obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by all things on it. He who swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you, tithe, you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. So they're bragging about that they go into their spice rack and they take their spices and they take a tenth of the spices and give it to the church. And it's not just the spices. That means they take a tenth of everything and give it to the church. That's great and that's wonderful. But he says, but when it comes to the weightier matters of the law, like justice and mercy and faith, you don't do it. There's no justice in you. There's no mercy in you. There's no faith in you. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you're like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you are out. You outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. That's what's going on at the Praetorium. They're filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness, and then they look at, at the people that follow them and say, we can't go inside because we got to eat the Passover and stay clean, and everybody's saying, oh, you're so holy. Okay, it's the outward appearance. This is they might have the clean hands of trying to do things right, but they do not have the pure heart. And that's the problem. All right. I think I'm on verse 29. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Pilate then went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Now imagine that as a prosecuting attorney. The judge says, what's the charge against him? And the answer the attorney gives is, we wouldn't have brought him here if he didn't do something wrong. In other words, we don't have any accusation. We just want him dead, okay? Then Pilate said to them, you take him and judge him according to your law. That's the great answer. If you don't have anything to tell me that he did wrong, then you take care of it yourself. There's nothing for you to bring to me. Therefore, the Jews said to him, well, it's not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. So the real reason they bring him to the Romans is this. If they don't bring him to the Romans, they have no power to execute. They can only rebuke. They cannot execute. So they bring him to the Romans to be executed. That's why they have to accuse him of claiming to be a king because Pilate's not gonna care about any doctrinal issues that come up. He's not gonna care if he says he's God. He will care if he says he's a king because he's working for a king named Caesar and that Caesar will not allow any competition. So that's what Pilate has to watch out for is any accusation of him being a king. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Now, there's the political question. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, are you speaking for yourself about this or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have 
you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Pilate, uh, Jesus answered, you say rightly that I'm a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I've come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who's of the truth hears my voice. Now, why is Pilate so uneasy with the Jews? He's already saying, I find nothing wrong with this man. Why doesn't he just let him go and let the Jews deal with it? Well, we have a record of Pilate's leadership of Judea. Judea was one of the least desired areas for a Roman governor to rule over because the Jews in this area had a history of uprisings. And if, the, if, if Caesar hears about uprisings continuously in a certain area and that governor doesn't control it, he'll get rid of that governor because he doesn't want to be bothered. And if he has to be bothered, he's going to hold it against uh, the, the governor of, that, of the land there. So... When Pilate first got brought to Judea, which I believe was AD 26, in the year 26, I think he was there from 26 or 27 till the year 36. So pretty much all of Jesus's ministry and a little more than that. When he first arrived in Jerusalem, he brought the Roman standards with the image of the emperor on it. Now the Jews do not like human Gentile kings in their city, images of them in their city. So they protested by surrounding Pilate's house and having a five day sit down in front of his house. They sat in front of Pilate's house, hundreds of them, for five days. And on the fifth day, Pilate threatened them that if you don't get up and leave, I'll have you beheaded. Where you sit, I'll have you beheaded. These Jews laid down where they were and stretched out their necks and said, go for it. And Pilate backed off and chickened out and, um, he got rid of the standards with the emperor's uh, image on it. A second thing that we read about with Pilate is that he took some of the sacred treasure from the temple and used it to build an aqueduct. And the Jews obviously knew that's not a sacred or a holy or even a Jewish thing to do. Uh, he did it for his own benefit and he used their money, their holy money, their sacred tithes, rather than his own money for that. And so they protested that for many days. And then he sent soldiers into the crowds and they started clubbing Jews to death. And they would just club them until they died. So these uprisings are what Caesar sent Pilate there to control and to minimize, but he actually provoked them through his actions. So his job is on the line here with Jesus. And that's why you see him so hesitant to simply do what the Jews want. Uh, he, he, he doesn't believe that what they want is right. They, he believes Jesus is innocent, but he doesn't just let him go because he's afraid of an uprising that can cost him his job. All right. So it also says here in verse 37, and I think this is very interesting. He says to Pilate, you rightly say that I'm a king, for this cause I was born. So what cause is the king born? It's to rule and all of that. But Jesus says the cause he was born to do is to bear witness to the truth. Just that simple. I'm a king who's come to bear witness to the truth. It's a very, very interesting purpose. So I love that our king is all about truth. He's all about truth and he's come to bear witness to the truth. All right, 38, Pilate said to him, what is truth? Now, my goodness, I think all of history changed because of this. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. Why do I think that changed the whole history of the world? Because he asked the perfect question, what is truth? and he has the truth sitting in front of him. And if we could, have got a, we could have got an answer out of Jesus about what is truth to Pilate, I think it would be an amazing thing to have. But instead it says, 
He went out. He asked the perfect question and he leaves without getting an answer. And it's a, it's a shame. But then he actually renders a correct verdict. The man in charge of discovering the truth about Jesus concludes this, I find no fault in him at all. I don't find any reason for him to be on trial. I don't find anything for you to be bringing him here to me. I find no fault in him at all. But I want you to realize that's very bold of him because he knows it's gonna upset the Jews and he just doesn't have a lot of wiggle room for upsetting the Jews anymore. Now, I also want you to know this, because when you get frustrated over the, over the condition of our country, whether it's over racism issues, whether it's over gender issues, whether it's over um, political issues, lots of reasons to be fired up about these topics. And it all comes down to the fact that our country, less so than ever since our founding, is looking to the absolute standard of truth for their worldviews. They're not looking to the absolute standard of truth for their answers. Instead, they've created their own truths and they've gone so far out of whack that I've even heard of legislation either passed or trying to be passed that says a man who identifies as a woman has the right to an abortion or some female thing like that. He can't get pregnant. Why don't we realize this? He has no issues with abortion he, as far as pregnancy goes. Yet he's being granted women's rights for things that he's biologically incapable of, of doing. That's the level of blindness that we've entered into um, in, in this country today. And as a high school teacher, a Christian high school teacher, I'm really struggling watching these kids go off to college every year because there is no more greater of an anti-truth establishment than the United States university system. And it's filtering down even into the elementary schools today. The elementary schools are now teaching in their curriculum anti-American lessons. Christopher Columbus was a bad man is being taught in our elementary schools. Now, the poison that we've poisoned ourselves with, we are now injecting that poison into our innocent children. And where I just started saying about two school years ago, I will write you letters of recommendation for college, but I'm warning you that you may lose your soul there. You may lose your grip on truth. Like these soldiers that fell, you could lose your balance in this world because you'll be persuaded by your professors to think evil is good and that wrong is right. It's happening in massive, massive quantities like never before in our country. And now they're going after the children, the elementary age children. Uh, and it's very, very serious business. And uh, I want to say that out loud as many times as I can in front of as many people as I can. We have to be on our guard by the decisions that are being made in the name of truth that are absolute lies. You have to have an absolute standard to measure these things by. C.S. Lewis said brilliantly, how would you ever know what a crooked line is unless you have some idea of what a straight line is? We don't know what a straight line is in our country anymore morally. And it's the Christian and it's the church that has to regain its authority in this country. We have got to strengthen our churches We've got to have the word of God from the pulpits become the authority again like it used to be because when that authority got stripped in the 60s, it's been massive decline for the last 50 years plus and we are in serious moral depravity now. And here was Pilate saying, what is truth? And that is the question that we've got to teach through the Bible to as many people as possible that Jesus is the truth. He is the absolute moral standard for truth. So in the very last verse of the book of Judges, I think nails it perfectly. It says, in those days, Israel had no king. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. No better description of our country today than everybody's doing what's right in their own eyes. That means no 
absolute standard. Everybody determines truth on their own. And just like it was chaos in the book of Judges, you can see the chaos that's happening in our country today. And let's conclude. Um, number 39 and 40. Pilate says to the crowd, but you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Should have been an easy answer because they have no accusation and he can find no fault. That should have been a no brainer. Then they all cried again saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. The other gospel writers are not quite so generous to Barabbas. They say he was a murderer, that when an insurrection rose up, he murdered people. Now, the irony of Barabbas is simply this. His first name, we are told, is Jesus. His name is Jesus Barabbas. Bar in Hebrew is the Hebrew word for son. Abba, as you know, is the Hebrew word for father. So it's almost like a junior nickname. This is Jesus, the son of his father. So here's the offer Pilate makes, that all of us make the same choice. It's do you want released to you Jesus, the son of a father, or do you want Jesus, the son of the father? Who do you want released into your life? Jesus of the world or Jesus of the heavenly father? And that's how this chapter concludes. Who do you want released into your life? The world and its ways or the biblical Jesus and all that comes with him? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you in your son Jesus' name. And Lord, as we battle, Lord, for clean hands and a pure heart, we pray that it wouldn't be for our sakes only but for the sake of our nation. Lord, you said, if we who are called by your names will humble ourselves, that you will hear our prayers from heaven and you will heal our land. So Lord, we do pray for a healing of this land. And Lord, we know that you first require that we humble ourselves. So before your mighty throne, Lord, we do humble ourselves and bow our knee to you, our great King. Heal us, we pray, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.